Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Today, we are talking to seller master, award-winning author and educator, Kevin Zraeli. For those of you who submitted questions beforehand, thank you so much. We are going to be incorporating most of those throughout our conversation and adding a few at the end as well. If you purchase the wines ahead of time from wine.com, great. Go ahead, make sure those are open, get them in some glassware so you can taste along with us as we talk and taste about those wines. If you haven't gotten the wines, no problem, they're still at wine.com. So after this, you can pop online and order them. The wines we're tasting in order are the Biacart Semon Brut Rosé Champagne, the Joseph Duhan Mekon Village Chardonnay and the Montredon Cote Rhone Rouge. Very excited about these three wines. Before we welcome our guest, I, I have to say this is a very special interview tasting for me personally, because way back in 2002, I took Kevin's class, the Windows on the World class. I took it at the Marriott Marquis. It was, I think, the second um, time it was offered after 9-11. But I was kind of in a very strange place. I was what I like to call a career intern. I was jumping around, job to job, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I loved wine. I loved talking a lot. Um, and I, I took this course and it kind of was the spark that said, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to teach wine. I want to talk about wine. I want to educate people about wine and I want to be in this industry. And so that put me on what has now been a 17-ish year uh, path in the wine industry. And um here I am full circle getting to talk and taste with uh, the person whose course helped put me on that path. So very exciting for me. So without, with that, um, I'd like to introduce Kevin's really welcome. Hey, thank you so much. It's good to be here. And of course, any teacher will tell you when a student says that they got something out of the class and and, and here you are 17 years later, wine.com. Mm. And I, I know I'm not the only one you were saying before that I'm sure there are many people where this was, it's such a great, it, it's introductory, but it's it's in depth as well. And it's really one of those that kind of gets the spark going that you're like, wait, 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 I want to know more. I want to know more. I want to know more. So um, so thank you. Um, well done. And um, yeah, I'd like to start kind of by talking about what started your path. Because um, you have this, this storied career with, you know, many awards and accolades. Mm. Um, but I want to go back to the beginning, and I know that there's not usually just one thing that kind of gets the wine bug going. There's like several moments. Um, so I kind of want to talk about your few moments that did their trajectory. Because I think your first class as you started teaching, you were even under 21, correct? Well, let's start with Woodstock. The festival. So start with, start with, everybody's <laughs> life starts with Woodstock, 69, right? 69, I went to Woodstock. Uh, and just so you know, I went to the 50th anniversary last year, and I had a wine bar there. And it was peace, love, and wine. And my, I was my, I had, it was unbelievable. Anyhow, I went there and I was a lost child. I don't know what you were like at, uh, I was 18 at the time. And anyhow, I decided to move up to this area. I grew up in Westchester County, Pleasantville, New York. So I'm going to go up to this area and find a college, just do it. And I found a college and I found an apartment and it was over a pizzeria and Mrs. Novi's Pizzeria. And one day I didn't have enough money to pay for the rent. And I said, Mrs. Novi, I, I, can I help? Can I wash the dishes? He said, no, go see my crazy son, Johnny. Johnny Novi, he opened a restaurant down the street. Well, he opened up a restaurant in a 1797 stone building in the middle of nowhere between New Paul's and Woodstock, population 400. And we had just opened in one day on a Sunday, actually, Craig Claiborne, who was the first uh, restaurant critic for the New York Times, came with an entourage of people, including a uh, famous chef, uh, uh, Pierre Frenet and Jacques Pepin. And they gave this restaurant in the middle of nowhere, a four-star rating. And it was the first and last ever to get a four-star rating by the New York Times outside of uh, the metropolitan area. I didn't know who they were. All I knew was the following. We had 20 reservations the week before, we are now at 120 reservations. So my starting as a, as, as a waiter, I, they needed a bartender now. I began the bartender. I had to learn the liquor. I had to learn the wine. I had to learn the beer. Wine, being a history major, boom, I'm in, I'm in. History major too. It's great. Yeah. Wine is so much history. It totally. totally. So that was your crash course, but then you also, in college, you wanted to start a course. Well, what I did is the local uh, community college up there uh, in upstate New York came to us, oh, you got a four-star rating. You must know something about wine or cheese. Why don't you teach a class? So now I'm 20 years old. By the way, you could drink in those days. Yeah. <laughs> I just I know, so you didn't know. do any of this illegally. I got it. <laughs> no, you make, make it sound like a 21. Ha, huh? you did it. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so I, I, uh, they came to, could you teach a class? And we said, sure, we'll teach the class. Wine and cheese 101. And I taught that when I was 20 years old. 
I knew nothing about wine and John, my, my, the chef owner knew nothing about cheese, but one step ahead of your students, it happened. Yeah. And, and yeah. then a few years later at the college, I, I was at New Paul's College at State University. And I said to them, I think you guys should have a, you should have a wine course, accredited wine course. And they said, no, we have enough problems with marijuana. We are, not, <laughs> we are not putting alcohol in. And I had to convince them. And I'm not gonna tell you, it's too long of a story. It's a good story for another time. But I convinced them that, to, that I would teach a two, court, two credit course, uh, wine course. I based it on the Cornell University. If anybody's gone to Cornell, they know what I'm talking about. And uh, that paid my way through uh, my, uh, my junior and senior year of, of college, being paid to teach. Teach wine. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, I wanna kind of foray into what you spent most of your career doing, which was a seller master of Windows on the World. Um, I mean, you were the one and only seller master right. there, um, but you had very little experience going in. So can you tell us that fantastic story of how you landed that job? Well, not little experience. You had experience in a restaurant, but well, I, I, I want to bring seller master. Well, actually, I became the manager of that restaurant. So by the time I got to uh, be 25, it went to get the job at 25. I had all the. I'd already been to Europe. I'd already been to I hitchhiked to California. I was a hippie. You hitchhike to California, you have no money. You got to get there. And I went to all the 12 wineries that there were in Napa Valley in those days. Now there's more than 500, as you know. You guys live out there. Uh, and then I, after I finished uh, college, I backpacked through Europe. So I went to every major wine region on earth before I was 24. And uh, to, to, it's a long story about how I got to Windows and the World, but I didn't go looking for a job. I was selling I wine. You were so, selling to them, right? Selling, you were trying to sell them wine. Trying to sell them wine. And I met a lady named Barbara Kafka, who lots of people don't know, but she was James Beard's editor. And she also created all the microwave cookbooks later on in life. And basically, she, she's, I went to sell wine. She says, what can you do for me? She says, I, I can help you with your wine list. And she didn't like that idea. I said, well, have you ever been to France? Yeah. You've been to Bordeaux? Yeah. You've been to Burgundy? Uh, you've been to Tuscany? You've been to Rioja? You've been to Napa? You've been to Sonoma? I said, yes, 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 yes. Out Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. How do you get somewhere? 10,000 hours. So I had my 10,000 hours in before I got to Windows in the World. And lucky me, I got to meet uh, uh, oh, some pictures here right now, too, you have coming wow. up. Yeah, such that's, a stunning view. That's Manhattan, and that's what I looked at for 25 years. Uh, you can see the Empire State Building. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, uh, that was, I, I got there, and Joe Baum said to me, Joe Baum, by the way, created the Four Seasons Restaurant in 1959 and 300 other restaurants. And I said to him, I said, Mr. Baum, what do you want? He said, create the biggest in the business that New York has ever seen, and don't worry about how much it costs. I could do that. And off, off to France, I went, by the way. Oh, by the way, the guy who took this picture, yeah. he said he said to look like James Bond. So I hope it sort I, of translates oh, a totally. little bit. I actually thought this was James Bond. And I thought we were changing subjects. So yeah, hmm. absolutely. Um, I can't, can't talk about my spy days. There we will. We'll get to the school. I think this is the, the school here. But you were, so you're your seller master at Windows of the World. And then what, what I guess, prompted you as, you know, you're creating this amazing wine list. You have these people coming in for this amazing experience that you're giving them. And so kind of what prompted you to, to begin a school? Well, I already taught the classes, uh, you know, at the community college. And uh, by the way, my degree started with history and ended up to be education. So I just put my passion and, and my education together. And also I, I said to this guy, Joe Baum, I said, how many sommeliers could I have? And he said, none, you're it. If you've never been to Windows in the World, it's an acre in size. Yeah. That's the 107th floor, and the 106th floor is another acre. He said, no, you'll have to teach everybody. So I taught all my captains. That's how it started. My captains then became really my sommeliers. Uh, and then, uh, then we started teaching uh, to club members. We were a private club at lunch. We had 2,500 members. Started teaching them, and they, they brought guests. And the more guests that they brought, the more students I have. And I'm very happy to say uh, uh, I've had 20,000 students graduate that class, the windows in the world Including you, you were my best student. Best I, did, student. I think I graduated. You didn't, I don't think it was fake. I think I actually. I did check, you did. it's okay. <laughs> You're doing well now, it doesn't make any difference. Thank right? you. I know, I just kept going. So yeah, just skip over that part, no. Um, and then and then you, you created this book, which um, I have here behind me. You have, um, I guess to, to go with the curriculum, right? You said there, there wasn't really a good book that kind of went with what you were teaching, so. They were all encyclopedic in nature. I love them, I love them, I love them, you Johnson. Uh, I, um, Alexis Lachine, Frank Schoonmacher. These were my books that I just ate up, but I gave uh, the, uh, even a small paperback to my students. And these are very well-educated people taking this class and they'd say, this is too much. We're just, we're here. We don't want to know everything. We just want to know how to buy wine in a restaurant or how to buy wine in a retail store. We don't want to get ripped off. So I started 
putting it together in my classes. And I, I wrote down after each, I had my tapes, classes taped. I didn't actually write the book. That's why in the book it's question and answer. So by the end of the year, it was this big. I had this much of, of, of the book. And now we just distilled it and got the right editors. Yeah, and, and now you're on and it sold 4 million copies. You're on your 32nd yeah. edition, um, which is fascinating because I know that, that this book behind me is, is much thicker than the one I had in 2002. So yeah. throughout the years, kind of what have you learned? Are we, are we just kind of revising based on um, what people wanted to know, kind of what you were teaching? How did that evolve? Real simple. When I started off, uh, French wines. That was it. And they weren't really making great wines. I think that the, the you know, uh, uh, this is my, by the way, the 50th anniversary. Uh, I started in 1970, this spring, uh, working at that restaurant called the Dupuis Canal House Tavern. And there was only French wines, possibly a couple of German wines you threw on there, you know, like Liebfrommel or Zeller Schwarzkopf. Italy was making terrible wines. Spain was still under Franco. Germany did make some good wines. California didn't exist. I just yeah. told you how many wineries there were. Uh, and then forget about Chile and Argentina and South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. I didn't have to study those. In New York, in the United States, that's what they wanted. So it was very easy for me. And that's why I'm doing French today because I, I, I went to France. I lived there. I went to every major wine region uh, when I was like 23 or something like that with appointments, with appointments. Uh, so, um, and I still, I'm going to be honest with you because I think you maybe feel a little bit. I know you a little bit. I'm a Francophile. I will tell everybody that now. I am too. Uh, the, and there's a reason why. And yeah. uh, I, I'm just going to do this real quickly. I know you have things to say, but yeah. there's six major grapes in the world, in my opinion. All uh, right. Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon, just to give you an idea. The best Riesling in the world, in my opinion, comes from Germany. The second best place is Alsace, France. The third best place is my state, the Finger Lakes of New York. Where am I going to find the best Sauvignon Blanc? France, in the Loire Valley, called saint serre puy Fumé. Where am I going to find the best Chardonnay in the world? Burgundy, France, under the names of Mirceau or Pouligny Montrachet or Macon that we're going to have, or Puy, if we say. Where am I going to find the best Pinot Noir? Burgundy, France. And this is where all the winemakers went to learn how to make those grapes. Where else am I going to find uh, Mirlot? In, in saint Million and Pomerol in Bordeaux. And of course, Cabernet Sauvignon is king uh, in uh, you know, the Médoc. So five out of the six major grapes in the world started and continue to be that way in France. Yeah, and we call them now international grapes because they're grown internationally, but they're where they began or found their best place to, to show that was France. So, so let's, let's taste these wines. History, history, history and tradition. And history and tradition. tradition. You're going to go to the Bella Corte Simon, and we're not talking about a new champagne producer. You know, we're talking about something that uh, 1818 it started. So, and it's a rosé. And I hope, yep. has, everybody, has everybody finished the wine already? I probably was. Uh, no, it's hard because it is a half bottle. It's way too easy. Oh, oh way too easy. It's, mine is already finished. I'm not kidding. Uh, <laughs> I am, no, I am kidding. I am well, kidding. Well, it is eight o'clock there, but yeah. Um, know, that's a, so, wait, no. so let's talk about this. Have you, you've been there, I, was, I imagine? Yeah, many times. Many times in Champagne, and unfortunately, it's one of my favorite drinks in the world. And my accountant, I'm not joking, my accountant told me last year I spent way too much money on Champagne because it was broken down. What did I spend on this? What did I spend on that? I won't even tell you what it was. But anyhow, uh, Abel Carlos Simon, uh, 1818, so they're not, they, they've been around for a long period of time. Uh, and they really weren't that big in the United States until I'd say maybe 20 years ago. Uh, now it's like you can't, you can't even get it. Uh, and they are the benchmark for Rosé. Uh, and I, it's the rosé has taken off, I think, more than the the brut, the brut rosé. Uh, I'm saying in general for rosé, I yeah. think that Carcassonne is the benchmark, and I know you guys carry all of them. You even carry the 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 Clos Saint Hilaire, uh, their big big top line. Anyhow, what am I looking at? All right. Oh, by the way, I want you to know. Let me see your glass. I can't see. Good. So I, I usually drink it out of it's kind of a white wine flute. Um, hybrid, if you will, right. because I tell us a little bit about why people should be drinking it not in straight on flutes. Well, you lose it. By the way, I hope you're counting. This is not a joke either. People always think I'm joking around. 49 million bottles. Well, there's actually going to be half of that in this because it's a half bottle. Wait, that's how many you bought last 49 year? Is that what you're counting? Million bubbles yeah. in the bottle. Oh, no, in the bottle. Nothing. So it's half of that in the half bottle. Right. Rose is hot. So this is really, really perfect. Again, this is a wine that's made from. 40% uh, Chardonnay, and the other 60% is red grapes, and they also add red wine back in, red grapes being Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. But uh, smell it. So pretty. <laughs> pretty. I'm getting, 
I, yeah. Isn't that that's a technical term, right? Pretty. Yeah, very, pretty. Very technical. And I'm basically, my approach to life is you like it or you don't. Uh, I actually like it too much. Obviously, obviously you're going to get all the things that are in, in most champagnes, like uh, the apple and, mm -hmm. you know, the yeast and stuff like that. But I'm getting raspberry in here. Raspberry and strawberry. And uh, raspberry and strawberry. And by the way, the glass, it doesn't have to be that flute glass. It can be a regular right. glass. I think uh, yeah, this is one of my favorites. And it's the only really nice one we have that's kind of a white wine glass, but it, it yeah. comes a little bit closer. So we love but I'm going to toast you. All right. I'm I have another glass here. I'm toasting you. I'm going to make believe everybody should be toasting. And that's a lot of noise there. But <laughs> give it a try. There's that, there's that raspberry again, a strawberry coming through in the taste. Um, and there's a great zest. That's what I like about champagne. Uh, the citrus part, the lemon lime zest of the end. Um, and of course, people should know this champagne is not, it's very, it's low in alcohol. You're not going to get like big 14, 13, 12. You're going to get 10, 11 type, type of thing in, in alcohol. But look, here's what happens. Tremendous amount of mousse, as they, they call it, you know. The, yeah, that's what I want to hear about the bubbles. But not yeah. over, overly done. It was actually balanced all the way through. And that's the biggest question I get from my students. When is the wine ready to drink or what's the best wine in the world? Well, the answer is quite simple. Uh, the best wine in the world is for you is when the fruits and the acids and the tannins are in balance to your individual taste. Now, I've been preaching this for 50 years. Finally, some people are listening. Everybody's calming down a little bit, you know. But this is also what I love about this uh, Bellecarte Salon. Uh, it is um, long lasting, you know, uh, mm -hmm. finish. I didn't try it a second time. I saw you did, by the way. But I didn't try it a second time. Waiting for the finish. And it's just going out and this mm -hmm. leaves a fantastic taste in your mouth. Of course, I could drink this alone, you know, but I yeah. thought I should put down what should go with it. Yeah. Salmon. Oh, that is, that would be Why funny. not? It's yeah. got the name on there, you know? But, but I do remember too, just from, from the course, and then obviously I've done WSET and everything, but talking about the finish, because you want the balance there, but you, you talked a lot about the finish and having like the balanced finish. You don't just want acid. You just don't want alcohol. You just don't want whatever. You want everything to keep going together um, right. integrated in tandem. And this one does that. And that's kind of the sign of that great in, in your class, I had something called the 60 second wine expert. Mm -hmm. Not really okay. champion. We'll do it on the next two wines. Okay. Basically, I never, I buy tens of millions of dollars a year worth of wine. And I don't make a decision on the wine until 45 to 60 seconds. And we might even ask to get into some mindfulness here with your group <laughs> is to take the wine, leave it in your mouth, close your eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try this. Yeah, it is a Zen okay. part. And watch what goes on when we get to the, well, now with the, when we get to our Macon Village. Mm -hmm. uh, because first taste of wine is usually a shock to your taste buds, no matter what wine it is. Right. And by the time you get to 30 seconds, it starts changing 45 seconds. So I wait till that 45 to 60 seconds, and I hope people will do it today. They'll, they'll see what I'm talking about. Let's do it. Uh, we got time. We can do that. We'll do good. it. We'll do, it. We'll do that on the Chardonnay. So one quick thing about this, about just, we have this in a half bottle. Um, yes. You know, how do you feel about half bottles? Big well, fan? Champagne, champagne I, perfect? I'm, I love half bottles, uh, um, and um, uh, my love, Jacqueline, um, uh, she's a Pinot Noir girl, you know? I'm a big Cabernet guy, so, uh, you know, it's not always going to work. She's not going to be happy, or I'm not going to be happy. So half bottles, I'm, I'm beginning to start up with lots more half bottles in my wine cellar. And this is a great way to also try a wine that you might not be able to get quite a full bottle yet, budget-wise, and a half bottle is a good way to get a little taste. I think the best thing that ever happened to the wine business is, is wine by the glass. And when I started Windows in the World, that was 1976. And by the way, I heard you had Stephen Spurrier on uh, yeah. recently. And of course, you know, that whole big tasting in Paris, the judgment in Paris. Uh, so up until those days, we had a red and a white, you know, in a, decay, in a, a jug kind of thing we put out to a uh, uh, carafe. It was carafe wine. Yeah. I think that, you know, I'm talking, I know you're talking about half bottles, but I think a lot of half bottles, uh, they, they're not doing it as much in half bottles. I think they should. Uh, mm -hmm. because we're just going to wine by the glass. By the way, why do I think it's so good? Because you can get more tastes of wine at one dinner if you're going to be going out or to yeah. a bar or to a restaurant when they open. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the restaurant tour is happy because they're actually making a better markup. And the wholesaler and distributor is very happy because they're going to get 10, 15 case drop. So it's a win, win, win situation for everybody. Yeah. But and I think that technology has also helped, um, I think, restaurants be able to preserve wine when they do it by the glass as well, which I know had been... Probably a problem. 
Fact. Well, my stat right now, which uh, I haven't checked recently, but the stat that I got from the National Restaurant Association is that over 50% of all wines sold in tablecloth restaurants are wine by the glass. Mm -hmm. So that says something about people are looking for, you know, here it is, a half bottle of champagne. Yeah, perfect. Cool. All right, let's move on to Burgundy with uh, the Macon Village. Um, so this is Chardonnay. I think Chard Chardonnay might be my favorite grape because I just think it's so diverse because then I can drink champagne, I can drink Burgundy, I can drink California, I can drink wine from everywhere. But um, this is also one of my favorite wines. I feel like this is the kind of, this kind of wine is what kind of was one of the things that got me into wine because I was like, wait, this, this is so much better than, you know, whatever cheap $10 wine I was being given in college or the box wine. All of a sudden I found something I could afford that was, had character and, um, you know, interest and depth. And I just was kind of blown away. And it was a, you know, once I just tasted real uh, higher end white burgundy, um, that was it. But here we are. Um, I think this is bone. She will like it. It. Yeah, it looks like it. And of course, yeah. I've probably been to Burgundy 50 times. And there's the Drouin uh, family. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would say that there are uh, a, a great producers, uh, you know, but the Drouin family, you know, we're talking about the 1800s as well, 1880. They've been uh, around. And, uh, uh, Robert Drouin, who is still the patriarch. And uh, there, there they are. are. And Veronique, who's actually also running the um, domain. Uh, um, uh, out in, um, in Oregon, Oregon yeah. making some unbelievable wines. Ugh, Interesting. I, I don't know if we're going to find them. I don't know if they decided to use some of those uh, wine lists that I sent you. But uh, when I started oh. at that restaurant, yeah. the wine list it was on slate. And I still have them because I painted them all. And believe it or not, now when we talk about Macon Village, the, the mm -hmm. other wine, there's others. There's Macon, there's Macon Vare, there's Macon uh, Vinzel, oh, yeah. but the other one is Puy Fuisse. Mm -hmm. And that was the Pinot Grigio of the early days. And on the wine list that I have back from the 1970s is the, uh, the um, Puy Fuisse, <laughs> get ready for this, was $9 a bottle, but the Pouligny Mont Rocher was seven. So it's changed, everybody's going through it. And the other great thing that people should know if they don't know this already, Chardonnay is the number one grape uh, variety that Americans like. Soon to be overtaken by Cabernet, by the way. So it's, it's neck and neck right now. But nowhere on this label, as you see it here right now, everyone can look at their label, it doesn't say Chardonnay. Nope. But in France, they don't tell you the name of the grape. In Italy, they don't tell you the name of the grape. In Spain, they don't tell you the name of the grape. Thus, old world wines. So you and I had to study this. So it's 100% Chardonnay, not just Chardonnay, it's 100%. Uh, and of course, uh, 2018, they've had some really, really great vintages in Burgundy lately. Uh, mm -hmm. They've had some problems with weather, uh, but not getting enough crop, but the quality has been unbelievable. So here we go. May I, may I taste this wine? Oh, please taste and talk uh, us through it. First thing I'm going to look at, when I, do, when I do tastings, corporate tastings, I put a Sauvignon Blanc, usually a Sancerre versus a, a white Burgundy. Uh, this has got no oak. And this is the great thing about most Macrons. Most of them are unoaked. But even the color of the Chardonnay without oak, and of course, most Sauvignon Blancs in the world don't have any oak. So you can see the difference right away. So this is not white. This is into a yellow, uh, a yellow, a little bit more than a green yellow. So that's exciting for me looking at the color. Now I smell it. I want you to show you how I taste wine. Smell it once. And now, the, the, of course, a Chardonnay is apples again. <laughs> you, you know, you, it just ripe apples. Soft, the word that you used before, I forget what it was, but this is a soft uh, smell. It's yeah. also not too high in alcohol, but do this for me, all right? Okay. Put your hand over the top. All right, show everybody here. Hand over the top. I want to show everybody that all of these thousands and thousands of people that are watching this. Ready? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, open it up. Smell it. And I have to, for the life of me, I don't know why people don't do that the intensity of the aromas were just increased at least 10 times for me. And everything, everything, 95% of taste is smell. I want to yeah. get it here right now. You can't, so, if you have a cold, you can't smell it. I mean, if you have a cold, you can't even taste it. And, and well, three things happen, by the way. You intensified the smell. If the glass was dirty, you just cleaned it. And if you got like this and you got it on your hand, you, you can have a rosé in a second after the red wine. So a toast again. A, a toast, toast again. Toast again. I keep toasting. I like my this big, My big, I love my big. I live in room and taste wines with all of you people around the country. Fresh, clean, like biting into a, a fruit, an apple. Again. And yeah. that's what I like about Burgundy. Me too. And I'm not going to, uh, you need a good acidity, especially with food. 
I don't right. wanna, I don't wanna, I don't want to knock other countries and their Chardonnays. I don't want to do that. But the the true Burgundy is elegant and delicate. And again, this is not an overpowering wine, which makes it fantastic for food. Uh, <laughs> a, a, as an aperitif, you could have it like that as well. And I say, yeah. why? I think this is one of the best w uh, white wine values in the world. Not to, you know in the world. Uh, we, had, we had somebody who was registering. It's like I buy this eighty percent of the time. I mean, what? Wh why? Why am I doing that? But I think what you were just saying—the balance, the acidity—for right. the cost, it just has such great character and kind of—I don't want to call it a super complex wine, but it has some layers of different things going on. It's, very it's perfect. I'm sorry to say, and, and pe people think. Uh, by the way, my my not my virus uh, uh, <laughs> resolution, but my New Year's resolution. <laughs> was in January, not in March, was to go down into my wine cellar, which I have a pretty good wine cellar, and drink all the bottles of wine that are 20 years and older. Uh, and um, uh, I'm doing quite well on that, just so you good. know. I've been in isolation for four months, a lot of good wines that I'm drinking. But my go-to wines are the wines we're having tonight. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, I could add, and I will add, this is French, in the Rhone, I would add, add a Beaujolais Cru for the French good. side. And then in my in my cellar for every day people come over, it's Antonor Chianti Classico Reserva. That's it. There you are. That's my uh, people are coming over. I'm I'm not first of all, nobody's gonna listen to this, of course. But I my my philosophy is never give great wines to your friends or relatives. I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> you, know, I, like, you know, I will share with my parents because they're the ones who got me into wine. So okay, right. but so these wines are uh, again for the value, you can't go wrong. And what did yeah. I put down here? I forgot. I love this. For shrimp. Okay, Ooh. think about this with shrimp. Think yeah. about this with crab cakes because of the acidity. acidity. And then the richness of the crab cake, that acidity will, that's great. And I think it's rich enough to go with lobster. Rich yeah. enough to go with lobster because it's, uh, I don't think Sauvignon Blanc works with lobster, uh, you know, because it's so, again, the texture of the food and the texture of the wine is what I'm looking at. You like yeah, that? This is, this is a wine I buy for myself often make on village. Um, I love what Veronique is doing in Oregon. The Oregon Chardonnays are also some of my favorites. And there are some wonderful Chardonnay makers in California who are keeping that acidity and really doing well. well. I will say now this, that I've, I've done this for 50 years now. As a matter of fact, I just wrote in my new edition that comes out mm -hmm. in October, the Windows on the World Complete Wine yeah. Course. The my publisher said I had, no, my publisher said I had to mention it. I don't know why. Uh, but I, I started uh, writing something called Witness, excuse me, it was called Witness the Wine and Food Revolution. I changed it to Windows on the Wine and Food Revolution. Okay. It was supposed to be a 16 page insert. Now it's over 50. It's about one and restaurants. It's not just about wine. And it's like a hundred quotes. So watching this whole thing go on, uh, you know, people's tastes changing. Look, uh, you know, we're now unbelievable restaurants. We don't need to go anywhere. We have great wine. But California, in my personal opinion, and I've talked to a lot of the people that were on your show, mm -hmm. California got carried away with oak and, and alcohol uh, and, and at the very uh, onset of Chardonnay, overpowering wines. Today, I totally agree with you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they were too big, too high in alcohol to go with food. Yeah. This is a food wine. This is a definite food wine. Yeah, sometimes it's when people go so far to hit whatever people want right then, and then there's a backlash and everybody has to come back and, and create something that I think also showcases the grape the best way they can. So pure, I mean, this is just Chardonnay, pure Chardonnay. And oh. I, I, I forget what it costs, but again, as you just said, uh, I bet wine.com has it. I'm 20. Oh yeah. Of course. <laughs> really? I should look uh, that up. I'll find <laughs> out for you. Wine.com has it. All right. We're going to go to the Rhone Valley right now. Oh, there you go. Mike's. Oh, there we go. Yes. There it is. Wine.com has it. Box. About $22. Show me your Chardonnay in the, in the world that's as good as this. I know. At that years. price, it's going to be And fast. again, with the heritage uh, of the Druan family and a great vintage. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll stop. It sounds right. like I'm working for you, but I, I, I'll okay. never know. I'm here on my own. I'm here on my own. No, you're recommending the wines. It's just we have to sell. We sell a lot of wines. But we're going to go to the Rhone, um, yeah. which I might sound redundant by going into the fact that this is another one of my favorites. But I do. That's the place in France that I've been the most often. Um and Cote de Reds are kind of my version of Econ Village for whites, like Cote de Reds. Um, so we're having the Mont Redon Cote de um, And, you know, Rhone Valley. Yeah, talk, talk to us a little bit about this wine in this place, because I know you've, you've been there. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm very, very lucky. I've actually been to all of these areas. Um, um, by the way, I haven't traveled in four months, <laughs> just so you know. Last year, I did 60 cities around, around the world. It's a whole new world for me. And that's why I thank everybody for Zoom. I can't begin to tell you, I'm sitting in my living room. We're, we're all of these, like I said, thousands and thousands of people listening in and tasting wines with me. And right after this, I'm jumping on my bike, just so you know. I'm okay, outside. we're going off the champagne. Well, here are there's, the galley, which this is Chateau Neuf de Pop. Montredon is in Chateau Neuf de Pop, but we're having their, their coach around. But that's the soils are one of my favorite parts of Chateau Neuf de Pop here. Well, obviously, it retains the heat. All right. those, all those, it looks like you, you can't grow anything there. It's impossible mm -hmm. to grow. But look at it. I, I think that, um, again, um, I start my first wine. Let's really get cut to the chase here. My first wine, I was an altar boy. I'm going to bring that up right now. I bet some people in the audience. <laughs> yeah. I remember Father Matarazzo, yeah. you know. I, I, I said, what do I do with the wine? There's some left over. He said, oh, it's sacred, it's sacred. You got to pour it carefully in the sink. And I carefully poured it in my mouth. And that's how it started. <laughs> but, but religion and, and the monks, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about for hundreds, thousands of years, actually. I mean, we're going back 2,000 years on this vineyard right now. 2,000 years uh, of growing grapes. And of course, uh, you, Chateau de Pop, New House of the Pope, that was a schism, by the way, being Catholic, I can talk about the schism yeah. in 1300, where they, 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 they moved the Vatican to Avignon, and mm -hmm. they, the summer house was the new castle of the Pope, and then they wanted it back in Rome. That's another story for another time. <laughs> After a lot of bottles of in wine. Catholic school, yeah. <laughs> in Catholic school, or whatever. But anyhow, let's take a look at this one. The first thing I'm going to look at when it comes to red wine, much more, I'm going to go, I just want people to know I'm on an angle. My head is above yeah. the wall. 40 degrees. Yeah, exact. What do you call 30? I never 40. did 40 degrees. Sorry, I was off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's really 40 degrees. I don't have my protractor with me. <laughs> it's hurting my hand, so I'm going to move quickly. The qu when I look at a wine, I'm saying, can you see through it? I'm asking everybody in the audience, can you yeah. actually on an angle see through it? And it's close. And I I'm going to make the decision right now that if you can see through a wine, any wine, anytime, anywhere, such as Pinot Noir, such as Gamay, Beaujolais, it's ready to drink. So this wine here right now, I've already put it down. You can have it today with food, but it could easily go another three years. Now we haven't tried it, but here's the great thing is the smell. Now there's red and black fruits in this wine. Sometimes Cabernet Sauvignon, primarily black fruits. Pinot Noir, red fruits. I'm talking about uh, red cherry, black cherry. And this is a blend of grapes. So that makes sense too. Uh, yeah, and this is, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this right now, because uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is my favorite grape, because I'm a Bordelais kind of guy. But second favorite grape that I have is Grenache, or Garnacha, because it came from Spain. It was, it's a Spanish grape that moved to, to France. So this wine, and 20% Syrah, because it's Southern uh, Rhone. Any of the smell, black olives. I still get some more of that raspberry in there. It's there. The fruit is there. There's nothing to block the fruit. Hand over the top. Don't forget. Try to get it on your hand. Oh, you did. Very good. And <laughs> keep going. Ready? One, one two, three. Smell it again. Okay. Spice. I have some spice. A black pepper spice. Now, I'm going to ask everybody to do this. This is. We might not get to a minute, but I'm going to ask everybody to take the wine, leave it in their mouth for three seconds. Everybody ready to do this? And ready. then... I don't know if the everybody else is. I'm trying to get them back. I'm speaking in. for them. I'm speaking for them. Everybody's ready. Leave it in your mouth three seconds and don't talk for the next 30 seconds and, and feel the wine. Toast. Toast, toast, toast. Okay. Three seconds in the mouth. You're at 20 seconds. Why am I saying this? It's because the, um, you're past the 15 seconds. And the first 15 seconds is going to taste different than the second 15 seconds, which is going to taste different than the third. Mm -hmm. I'm going to actually go to 45 seconds, if I may. You may. No, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm trying to be real professional uh, about this because this wine has tannins. And, um, I'm feeling the, a But they didn't come in. At the, they came in a very little at the beginning. But now right. they're getting stronger. And if you don't know what tannin is, if you're in the audience, tannin is a, it's a, 
preservative, natural preservative, but it comes from the skins of the grapes and also from the oak. And the smaller the oak, the newer the oak, where it comes from, uh, will give you that. They don't, you know, we're not talking uh, about anything really, uh, it's more, more uh, from the grape skins here right now than it is from oak. Okay. And so here I am, I'm at 45 seconds. I, as a professional, have to make a decision. Is this wine ready to drink for me? And I'm saying right now, and by the way, I got black licorice. Mm, I didn't get it in the nose, good. but if you like black licorice, it's in there right now. And what am I getting? The tannins now, you know, I don't think we're going to have a football season. I'm not sure, but I always look at tannins uh, uh, as a, a blocker. They block out the fruit. And if they block out the fruit before 60 seconds, I say the wine's not ready to drink. And I'm at 58, 59, 60 seconds. It's a real close one. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you waited another 10, 15 seconds, your mouth would all be tannin, fruit's gone. Yeah. So that's why I say this wine can age. What happens to a tannin? It drops out. It, it turns into sediment. Um, so I love this wine. That's why, and Montredon, all of these wines, by the way, except, uh, uh, the Druen and the, and the Montredon are wines that go back with me personally for 50 years. You know, I can talk about other, other producers. As I said, there's a fantastic amount of producers in Burgundy and in the Rhone Valley. Um, but everybody, if you, if you didn't try it a second time, my mouth is now dried out. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna ask you this, okay? I'm gonna run a Zoom call. I've lost my saliva. How about you? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I did. I, although I felt it the most in the mouth, but yeah, that's sometimes how I explain it. It kind of was that the way to, because I think sometimes people get confused between acidity and tannin. So I'm like, acidity gives you saliva, right. tannin sucks it away. Right. So it, if you're, you know, and, and they kind of are the yin yang of, of, of that wine structure. But yeah, it dried out on the lips. There was still good fruit and it kind of faded off, but I feel like this is a good, I mean, how long, how much would you say this could age? Because I would say like five to 10 years maybe, but I would feel like five would be a beautiful at, time. At least until tomorrow. I, I, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm going to try it tomorrow too. This is, good. this is good for your people that buy from you. Yeah, try a wine every day and see how every it day. goes. Every day. Uh, every day. Try it every day. Tell me what you think. <laughs> but I, I say in my classes, okay, and everybody's got this taste right now. I've only tried it once. My mouth is dried out. It's it, the same tannin as in tea. The same tannin is in walnuts. It's the exact same thing. So at Thanksgiving, you put all these walnuts in your mouth. First thing you want to grab is water to you know give you something more than all that tannin. And I say to everybody, oh yeah, yeah, I'm getting that. My mouth is dried out. I say, okay, everybody check their neighbor for saliva. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know <laughs> if I did that. Here. <laughs> Nobody want, everybody looks at me at that point in time. They're not looking this way or that way. <laughs> I know, I go straight forward. But then, so what, but so pairings for food for this, because we'll talk a little bit about like what tannin does really well with from a food pairing since you're, you've been in restaurants so well, long. Um, I also was very lucky to work with the Walensky restaurant uh, uh, after I actually I did uh, the Canal House and Windows in the World. And Smith & Walensky was created by a guy named Alan Stillman who created Fridays. So all, all close friends. Anyhow, uh, steak when you go to those steak restaurants it doesn't have it's smith walensky or del frisco's or wherever you are uh you know big sirloin steaks with big full-bodied cabernet sauvignons this is not a big full-bodied cabernet sauvignon so it doesn't need it doesn't have to have a great sirloin steak by the way if you're a vegetarian think about portobello mushroom type of okay. thing the texture of that with this one it's texture with texture so i probably have this with steak free very mm. simple Good. It's oh, and I remember when I was in France, I lived on the trains. I remember I'm in France at 23 years old, no money, by the way. I, I by the way, it's a theme in my life. I, actually, I'm sorry to say no money, but anyhow, I, I lived on youth hostels. Putting it all in wine. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> youth hostels, uh, uh, URL pass on the trains, and hitchhike. That's how I got to all these places. But on the trains, they had two choices of wine uh, red wine. Red and wine. And well, sometimes you're right. And they were in plastic containers, like milk containers. But <laughs> also they had a Beaujolais and they had the, uh, they had the Cote de Rhum, simple Cote de Rhum. The, but the Beaujolais was 12% and the Cote de Rhum was 14%. And you, you had to sleep, sleep on this train for the next eight hours, drink the Cote de Rhum. <laughs> and there's a lot I, of it. Yeah, yes. Well, I, I do like your methodology there on, uh, on choosing. So, um, so I'm going to throw out a couple of questions that actually we got from people who registered to taste with us. Right. Um, one was from Ali in Las Vegas, wanted to ask you, what up and coming wine regions are you kind of impressed with at the moment? Are you interested in? You know, I have a different way of answering that uh, because I think I did a tour um, uh, a few years ago and I, um, 
you might know Robin Kelly O'Connor, but Robin mm -hmm. Kelly O'Connor and I went on a tour around the world. Uh, and we went to every major country, uh, wine country, uh, say, say, call it 20 countries. We went to 400 regions and 800 appellations, all in within one year. And we tasted 6,500 wines. What did I come away with? I came away with, and I wanted to do it all in that short period of time. I came away, this is the golden age for wine in the history of the world. I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about all the SKUs that you have at wine.com. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's amazing, the, the variety of wine. So with that said, what's old is new again. Whereas the Beaujolais, we drank as kids and stuff like that. A Cru okay. Beaujolais today, a Beaujolais Village and the, and the different producers that are there, it's Suave, even a Suave, you know, it was a cheap oh, white wine. Today, they're, you know, they're, they're being organically and biodynamically mm -hmm. uh, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. By the way, the it's Druids. Israel, I mean, Israel's big right now. Like Israel has some amazing wines coming out that I'm sure they've been making forever, but we just haven't seen them. So old. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. But I know some friends of mine that are working there bringing them in. I was in Sicily all last summer. I went to Sicily. I had to spend the Edna, summer. Edna. Well, there is Sicily and there's Mount Etna. Yeah. Okay. You separate the two. But they did something, uh, you know, like 20 years ago, and they said, they said, all right, the government said, you're putting Cabernet in, you're putting Chardonnay in, you're putting Sauvignon Blanc and Syrah and make the quality of wine better. So now we are 20 years later, they don't need those grapes. They yeah. learn to use their own grapes, the Nerdavala, et cetera. Uh, so that's an area, but I, I just think there's so much just in Italy and Spain and France and so much wine. I don't know, I, honestly, I don't know how the consumer does it now. So when I started, it was easy. Well, they have to go to wine.com where we have wonderful filters and online help for chatting to get recommendations. Well, the most okay. important thing that you're doing is this, not me, uh, uh, bringing people, uh, uh, especially um, they don't have to travel. You can do it uh, wherever they're located. Education is the number one thing. Uh, and the only way to understand a bottle of wine is not through books, except mine. But, but you got to open, the, you got to take the cork out. Open the bottle. You got to open yeah. the bottle, uh, and that's how you learn. So uh, I, I don't. I say the only thing I'm going to do uh, that I have left, and I, I really don't want to travel again for the rest of my life. But I, I would go back. I would go to the Black Sea, hmm. uh, to okay. Romania, Bulgaria, Georgia, uh, Turkey. Uh, you know, that was. I don't know Croatia's right there, but I know friends who have Croatian wine. Not on the Black Sea, but the fact remains is yeah. the Silk Route and the old mm -hmm. Silk Route going through those, and and this they have a history of grape growing and winemaking, just like anything else. It gets better if people invest in it uh, and put the right grapes in. And of course, this is what happened in California. When they started in California, when I was out there in the 70s, uh, the, uh, the Riesling is over there, the Chardonnay is over here. We don't know why. Uh, the Pinot Noir is down there and the Cabernet Sauvignon is right down the driveway and we'll put a sun that says Cabernet. So everybody knows that we know what we're doing. And again, thank God for Phylloxera 30 years ago, wiped out California. They wouldn't have pulled out the vines. They pulled them out. They put them in the right places with the right soil. That's one of the biggest things that's happened in California. So if you like California wines now, they're going to only get better is what I, what I can say. That happened in Bordeaux too, there was, because there was a lot of white before phylloxera and then they replanted a lot with reds. So as a white wine or Bordeaux white lover, you know, I'm glad they're picking the best places for it. But yeah, I think that that was an interesting change there. So um, next question. And I, I do love the, your point of education because I think that, you know, tasting wine is different than drinking wine and we want you to be able to drink wine and enjoy it. And so learning to taste wine with education, like you said, is important to then appreciate all the wines you end up drinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's what yeah. The, uh, the wine school, I'm, I'm going to, I have to say something because it's sad for me because I do, I am a sports guy. I'm a basketball coach for years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and my biggest thing is uh, theater, arts and music. I actually produced hair. Uh, two years ago, summer stock last year, I produced Jesus Christ Superstar. So it's not just about wine for me, but um, that the the uh, tasting of wine is just such a, an experience. And I think people who are watching this know exactly what we're saying. But this will be the first time in 45 years that I have not, I will not be able to teach a live wine class. Yeah. So keep the Zoom thing going, will you please? Keep the Zoom thing going. But, but yeah, Zoom's doing well. We're gonna we're gonna keep it going. Um, my next question uh, from Matthew in New Paltz, and I had to throw that in because I know that you might probably even know him, is if your last night on earth and you had any bottle of wine to drink, which wine? Well, tell Matthew I'm going to go to his cellar. <laughs> and I do know his. When I saw New Paltz, I'm like, hmm. 
Mm, I, I didn't plant that. I didn't even know Matthew was going down. Um, you know, um, I, you know, you Johnson, uh, who I mentioned earlier, is a writer, um, uh, one of the most prolific writers ever in wine. Johnson's Robinson. I should have mentioned Johnson's yeah, as well. I love her. And of course, Karen McNeil with her wine Bible. Uh, you know, these are uh, uh, people that have been working a long time. But I, I, I. I don't know if I could pinpoint it to one wine, but you Johnson had a great thing that I'm gonna pick up on in the last decanter. He said he had a dream of the meal, that he had a dream of a meal in his head. And so I started, oh, what would I do? Well, I'm on, you know, I'm starting to think, okay, I'm doing a sancerre. It's not just the wine, it's the food that goes with it. Yeah, that's true. I, I've never, actually, I've never, I don't, I'm doing, I'm, you can see I'm not even drinking the wine right now because it's wine and food. It's always been about wine and food because I grew up in the European tradition. So, oh, I'm clams and oysters with a the sauce there. Then I'm going to move to a uh, lobster. And, and the lobster is going to have, a, you know, now I'll we'll get into a Mirceau or a Poligny Marche, a white burgundy. Of course, you can hear all French wines right now. And then, okay, Bordeaux. My favorite Bordeaux is Chateau Latour. And I'm very lucky uh, uh, that I've tasted every, uh, every vintage of Chateau Latour since uh, 1990 to 19, uh, 2016, plus others from the 1800s. Uh, so that's my go-to wine. So if you, anybody wants to send it to me, Kevin at kevinisraeli.com. I have a feeling they'd prefer to just have your address to come drink it with you, but you know. I can't give that away. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So the final question is, is a little bit more of a, a somber note, but um, you were at Windows on the World. Sorry? I was going to say, I'm having shot to Latour with my lamb. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Good. No, I'm not gonna um, so you were at Windows of the World. It's kind of hard to think about that you know, magical restaurant without also thinking about the tragic event that kind of uh, took it away from us. So we had Matthew from Ohio asked about reflecting just kind of your feelings just about the upcoming anniversary of 9-11 and also just what helped you to persevere after that? I'll answer this last question first is a, a great childhood. I, I have great parents. I have two sisters uh, that I've always been close with. And I think that resilience is the word that I'm, I'm I, I wonder where it comes from myself. Um, there was uh, several other tragedies uh, right after that in my family, and we were able to uh, sort of put ourselves together. Um, and 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 uh, I just want people to know because I, I keep the name Windows on the World on the book. People, young people, don't have any idea what Windows on the World is. I mean, here we are on the 19th year and 20th year coming up. You know, the millennials, are, you know, they, they didn't know about it. Windows on the World was the number one dollar volume restaurant. Uh, in the world in 2001. We sold more wines than any restaurant in the world in 2001. Uh, you know, and we, we, uh, we lost 82 people that day. Uh, and um, I, I, think, I, I think that I do this, as my therapist said, if you don't continue to do your passion, then you're gonna die. That's his exact words. So uh, I, I, with all of the people that are still around, we, we get together, it's like a fraternity, sorority, whatever you wanna say, we're all survivors and, and we meet uh, 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 at least once a year uh, to celebrate the people that we worked with. Uh, but it was a magical place. Um, the Dupuy Canales Tavern for six years, magical. So I, I was very, very lucky. And that was, a, as people know, the word restaurant means to restore. And, and so that, that's something, and that, that was my family back in the, when I was in the seventies was the canal house. My family for 25 years was windows on the world. Uh, and so um, I'm just happy that, uh, that I'm still here to, to preach the word of windows on the world for those people that we lost. Thank you. And we're glad you're here to continue your wine education efforts. And I'm glad you honor them with that, the book title still and keep that kind of alive with that story, because I think it's so important. I read your intro for this, new one. And I feel like you just, you honor that history so well. So I appreciate that. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be here, to taste, to talk about the wines, talk about your story, your history, and teach everybody a little bit of tasting etiquette and swirling. Uh, is this part exercises. one? Is this part one? Or are we doing part two soon? I, I'm, I'm in. I'm okay with that. Where are we going? Italy? Talk to that guy who owns this place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Italy. The one hour, one hour Italian wine expert. I'd love to do that. Okay, well, we'll talk. One French wine, one hour American wine expert. I can do them all. I know, I know you, and you have the American wine uh, book, which is fantastic too. So, but yeah, I, I just, I appreciate your time so much because. Thanks to everybody. Wealth that, uh, of knowledge uh, and it's been fantastic, so. And, uh, and hopefully uh, we, we'll have me back and uh, I'll have better jokes. I promise better jokes. <laughs> we always love your sense of humor. That's what makes you so entertaining. So thank you. We're gonna cheers.
Cheer. Cheer. I got it. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice. And now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com, seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.